part one. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the rental of a car. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to five. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Cheapy's Car Hire. Can I help you? Yes, please. I need to rent a car. That's no problem, sir. When would you like it? Tomorrow morning. Let's look then. Today is the sixth of August, so you'll need it on the seventh of August. That's right. Now I'll just need to take some details from you, sir. Can I take your name, please? John Wilson. And your home address? Ninety-five Green Lane, Manchester. Green, like the colour? Yes, that's right. And the postcode is MW seven four DF. Okay, got that. Can I have your telephone numbers, please? My home number is o two o six eight three four six three eight seven, and my mobile is zero seven 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 nine. Seven two four eight six eight. Sorry, I missed the mobile. It's o seven 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 nine seven two four eight six eight. Thanks. Now, are you the holder of a full current driver's license? Yes, I am. Could I take the number of the license, please? Sure. Let's have a look now. It's w i l nine four eight five seven. Eight two six nine. And will there be any other drivers, or just you? Only me, please. Okay. You said that you wanted the car tomorrow, but how long will you want it for? Well, tomorrow's Friday the seventh, and I want it for the whole weekend. So I'll bring it back on Monday morning. I'll have to charge you for all Friday and Monday, sir. That's okay. Good. Now, what kind of car were you looking for, sir? I'd like a fairly small car, as I'll be driving a lot around town, and a smaller car will be easier to get around and to park. Yes, that's true. Well, I've got small sizes in the following types of car: a Ford, a Renault, and a Toyota. They're pretty much the same, though the Toyota is in a cheaper price category. I'll take the cheapest one, please. And we can offer you a petrol or a diesel model with that car. Oh. In that case, I'll take the diesel, as that will be more economical. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen carefully and answer questions six to ten. Now, how much would this cost me? Well, the daily rate is fifty pounds, but it's only forty pounds if you take the car for four days or more. Let's see. There's also an additional ten pounds for insurance. That's not obligatory, but we do recommend that you take the insurance. Yes, definitely. So that'll be a hundred and seventy pounds for the four days then. Fine. Where can I pick it up? You can pick it up here, at the airport, or at your hotel. Which hotel are you in? I'm staying at a friend's house next to the International Hotel. So, can you leave it at the International Hotel, and then I can walk around to pick it up? I'll drop it off at the same place if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. By the way, if you have a breakdown or an accident, we'll supply you with a new hire car ASAP. Our emergency number is on this customer information leaflet. Which also has other information. Here you are, and here is a spare set of keys for the car. Now let me tell you about some things in the car that will be there to help you. First of all, your insurance documents will be in the glove compartment, along with a Wesley City map and the car manual. On the back seat, there will be a larger area map of the local district. If you need a map of any other place, like London, then give us a call, and we'll make sure it's there. No, I won't need that. In the boot, you'll find a spare wheel and a set of tools in case you have a problem. 
We have membership with the RAC, so you can call them if you're really in trouble. The membership card and phone number is in the glove compartment too. There will be a small fire extinguisher under the passenger seat, but I hope you won't have to use that. Great. So where do I pay? If you go over there to Mr. Walker, then he'll sort you out. That is the end of part one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 2. You will hear the master of a university hall of residence giving a short introductory talk to new students at the university hall of residence. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the short introductory talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Chelston Hall of Residence. My name is Dr Frank Jones and I am the Master of Chelston Hall. As you will know, you are all attending Westley University to study different courses and Chelston Hall of Residence will be your home for the first year of your studies. You're all first year students as Chelston offers accommodation only to first year students at the university. In this short talk, I'm going to go through some of the things you ought to know about life in the hall. I will also go through some rules so that we can all live together in a satisfactory way for the whole year. First of all, I would like to go through the eating arrangements. Chelston Hall offers full board accommodation, so there will be breakfast and dinner every day with lunch also available at weekends. You're not obliged to go to the meals, but they will be there if you wish to take advantage of them. In fact, it would be a waste of money not to, as you're paying for the food in your hall fees. The times of the meals are as follows. Breakfast is served from 7am to 8.30am every day, though these times are an hour later at weekends. Dinner is served at 6.30pm to 7.45pm, seven days a week. On Saturday and Sunday, lunch is served at 12.30pm to 1.45pm. If you're late, then you will not get any food. Once the hatches are closed in the dining hall, they stay closed. The dining hall is cafeteria-style service, and there's always a selection of food for vegetarians. If there are a lot of people at the dining hall, then please queue up in an orderly manner and wait your turn. Please do not push into the queue. At the end of your meal, please take your tray over to the side tables and put your dirty plates and utensils in the appropriate places. We do have kitchen staff, but they're not your servants, and we expect you to take your own dishes and cutlery off the table. Rudeness and incivility to the staff will also not be tolerated. Each evening after dinner, there will be coffee and tea available in the common room until 9.30. Again, please don't leave cups lying around, but put the dirty ones back on the trays provided. The coffee service will be discontinued if the common room becomes an untidy tip. Other facilities that we have here on site are a TV room and a self-service laundry. The TV room has one set, which can receive the regular channels, but no satellite channels. The laundry room has eight washing machines and eight dryers. These are all coin operated. You will need one pound in two fifty pence pieces for one wash. The dryers take twenty pence pieces and will run for fifteen minutes on one twenty pence piece. We recommend that you buy a box of washing detergent at the local supermarket, but you can buy individual packets of washing powder from a vending machine, providing it hasn't run out. One individual box from the machine is good for one wash. You now have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the short introductory talk and answer questions 16 to 20. As you will know by now, the hall is divided up into corridors, with six rooms attached to each corridor. Each corridor has shower compartments, one bath and a kitchen. 
We have cleaners who clean up the corridors and bathrooms, but the cleaners are not responsible for cleaning the kitchens. So if you want to cook something in addition to the food we provide, then please clean up your dirty pans and plates yourself. If any kitchen gets into too bad a state, then it will be closed and locked up for the remainder of the term. Any dirty dishes or pans that are in the kitchen will just be thrown out. By the way, as you will also know, the corridors are co-ed, so you will need a reasonable amount of consideration and modesty moving around to the bathrooms and back. Another important issue is our fire drill. Please make sure that you have read the notice, which is in every corridor, about what to do if there's a fire. It's very important that you know where your nearest fire exit is, and where to go when you get out of the building. For example, if you're in Block A, there are two exits, and not everyone should exit from just one of these. The assembly point for both blocks is the car park, where your block leader will take a roll call to make sure no one's left inside. We're obliged by the fire service to perform two emergency practices every year. Please take them seriously, as if they're not done well, then we shall have three or four or five practices, or however many it takes to get it right. Finally, we have the issue of noise. For a lot of you, this will be the first time not living at home with your family, and you will have access to lots of friends your own age and alcohol. I must urge you at all times to try and behave with consideration to your fellow hall tenants at all times. Don't play your music too loudly or make too much noise at any time, and especially at night. People around you all the time will be trying to work, sleep, or just relax. Have fun, but think of others. We take quite a strict attitude to those who end up annoying everyone else. If you're found to be disturbing others in the hall to an unreasonable amount, you'll be warned, and if the problem persists, you'll be asked to leave you will not receive any refund of the funds you have paid. I hope that I have not unduly worried anyone. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 3. You will hear two students discussing their project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, Fred, thanks for coming over to my room. That's OK. I had a lecture near here this morning, so it was easy to come over. We've got to get on with this North Sea oil project anyway. So, did you manage to do any of the things that we decided last week? Most of the things. I got all the books from the library and saw Mr Peters about the research. He told me the names of some good sites on the internet where I could find lots of information about the North Sea oil industry safety issues. He's a great tutor, isn't he? Yes, he is. So I checked out the sites and made some notes. What about you? Did you get the information on the background and history of the North Sea oil industry? Yeah, there were loads of information and I've made notes too. I think I've got it all covered, so let me tell you what I found out. I'll run the ideas past you and you can tell me if it's okay. Good idea. So, as you know, the North Sea lies to the east and northeast of England and Scotland. Apparently, the North Sea was long dismissed as a potential source of oil or gas, but over the last four decades, it has become the center of one of the world's most productive energy industries. Gas was actually first found in quantity in the Groningen area of the Netherlands in 1959. This was followed by the first British discovery of gas in the West Sol field, off the coast of East Anglia by the BP drilling rig Sea Gem late in 1965. Actually, the first accident was on that rig too. Anyway, sorry, go on Judith. The British oil and gas industry in the Southern North Sea grew rapidly in the early years. The deepening economic crisis in the UK meant that there was enormous pressure on the industry to get gas and later oil flowing. As exploration and investment moved further north, it became clear that there was oil to be found in great quantities. 
Discoveries of oil grew in number as more companies, British, European, and American, took out leases on sectors of the North Sea. During the 1990s, like the rest of the world, the North Sea industry was badly affected by the global price fluctuations. Nevertheless, production grew and peaked around 2000-2001. Now, the North Sea is regarded as a mature province on a slow decline. That's about it for now. I'll put more detail into it when we do the presentation. You know, statistics and all that. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. Yes, you've done a good job. Shall I do the same then? It's not as long as yours. Go ahead. OK then. As I said earlier, the first industrial accident relating to the industry in the North Sea happened only days after they discovered the first gas. The sea gem capsized with a loss of 13 lives. There are regular accidents on all oil rigs around the world, but the North Sea is just such a harsh environment that there always seems to be more there. The most famous accident and the worst disaster in the North Sea was the Piper Alpha disaster of 1988. Yes, I remember that one on the news when it happened. Today, the industry is very safety conscious. When you first arrive, you are given a safety tour of the installation, detailing all safety aspects including fire extinguishers, emergency muster stations, lifeboat stations and emergency procedures. You will be introduced to the rig safety program. Everyone attends weekly safety meetings and daily pre-tour meetings. The weekly meeting is an in-depth look at industry-wide safety news and other safety-related issues on the rig. The companies share safety information with other companies throughout the industry. This helps to avoid repeated incidents. A fire and boat drill is often held on the same day which involves a mock fire and a mock abandon the rig exercise. The pre-tour meeting is usually a description of the work carried out when you are off shift, the work you will be doing, the work others are currently doing that may affect you, and any other relevant issues of the day. Accidents do still happen as in every industry. However, statistics show that with the massive improvements in offshore safety procedures, you now have a higher chance of having fatal accidents if you work on a building site than you do when on an oil rig. Well, that's all from me. I'll add lots of details too. OK, well, let's plan what we have to do next. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part 4. You will hear part of an advertising lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 34. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 34. Good morning everyone. Today's advertising lecture is on the history and development of highway billboards and their effectiveness. Later on we will look at their design and different uses. The roots of billboard advertising can be traced to the invention of movable type printing by Johannes Gutenberg as far back as 1450, and advertising in the modern sense was launched in the form of the handbill. When the lithographic process was perfected in 1796, the illustrated poster became a reality. Gradually, measures were taken to ensure exposure of a message for a fixed period of time. In order to offer more desirable locations where traffic was heavy, bill posters began to erect their own structures. 
In 1835, the large American outdoor poster, more than 50 square feet, originated in New York in Jared Bell's office, where he printed posters for the circus. In 1900, a standardized billboard structure was created in America and ushered in a boom in national billboard campaigns. There are a number of reasons for the recent surge in billboard advertising, not the least of which is cost efficiency. Compared to other forms of advertising, billboards are a relatively inexpensive way to get your point across to the general public. Consider this, a newspaper ad is only good for a day and a television commercial only lasts about 30 seconds. But a billboard ad is working for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The cost of billboard advertising ranges from about $700 to $2,500 a month. At that rate, 10 billboards could run for as much as $25,000 per month. That sounds like a lot of money until you realize that a full page ad running for one day in a major newspaper costs about the same. So billboard advertising can be an effective and cost efficient way for entrepreneurs to spread the word about their products and services. The Outdoor Advertising Association of America estimates that US businesses spent more than 5.5 billion on outdoor advertising last year and the association is anticipating a healthy increase over the next few years. Advances in technology have also contributed to billboard advertising's cost efficiency. In the past, billboards had to be hand-painted, a time-consuming and costly venture. But with today's computer technology, billboards are designed on a computer screen, printed to vinyl or poster paper, and glued to the billboard structure. The result is higher quality ads in less time for less money. You now have some time to look at questions 35 to 40. Now listen to the rest of the lecture and answer questions 35 to 40. Let's now look at a famous example. In 1925, Alan O'Dell, who owned a small company that made a brushless shaving cream, noticed that gas stations and other local businesses were increasing trade by putting up advertising signs along the nation's highways. He decided that he could increase his sales by putting up sets of signs, five in a set. They would not have to be big, and a short line on each one would do. At first, Odell tried the hard sell approach. Sales began to increase at once, but that did not satisfy him. Motorists see these signs, he told himself, at remote places on the highway. Perhaps after hours of monotonous driving, they would appreciate a touch of rhyme and humour. They would indeed. It was not long before the catchy Burma shave signs, some ironic, some cynical, some absurd, but all of them funny, caught the fancy of nearly everyone, including those people usually critical of advertising. These signs continued as the advertising medium of the company for 35 years. And then, when cars travelled too fast to take in these messages, more than a dozen words painted in rather small letters, the company phased out its roadside advertising. Perhaps a growing criticism of this sort of advertising, which interfered with highway scenery, also influenced the company's decision. By late 1965, this criticism resulted in President Lyndon Johnson's Highway Beautification Bill. This bill authorised a federal state campaign to improve the scenery on either side of major highways, to conceal or remove junkyards and to put billboards sufficiently far back from the highway so that they would not interfere with the view. States that did not comply with the bill could lose 10% of their federal highway grant. But this was not the end of the billboard industry. Many roads were not part of the highway system, which was supported by federal grants, and these roads were not affected by the law, and nor were signs in commercial and industrial areas. Now let's look at some of the advertising developments in Europe. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Thank you.